Thank you, Lionel. Um, Gareth did say to me that one of the reasons he went back was that uh, he wanted to see the albatross again. He said they were his favourite creature of all of the creatures that he saw, and some of them were amazing. Um, but the, something about the albatross that affected quite a few members of the crew. Um, that's kind of the first time I've seen that slide, that's tremendous. Thank you. Um, we're going to invite now a, a panel of experts. This is really cool. We've got quite a few of them here that have come on the trip with us, and uh, we got to know them extremely well. And the difficult thing about this is that they all probably could stand up here and give you a presentation for about an hour, and you'd love it all. But I've been asked, if you don't mind, to get them once I introduce them. So just get across there and take a seat. If you could do it in sort of attractiveness order, that would be really good. <laughs> I'll leave you to. Uh, I'll leave you to work out who goes. But I'll leave you to the answer. What I've been asked to do is get them to. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. Look, it's right there for you. You can just sit there. There are not women here. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're going to do is get each one to speak for approximately two minutes. They've been given the two minutes time, uh, and it will be interesting to see who sticks to that. And if necessary, I'll just be going <coughs> over here. Uh, first of all, we're going to ask Dan Swartz to stand up. Uh, Dan, it, we've got a microphone for you to talk. Just let take it out of the time. Check if you like. Just give it to Anton, he knows how to turn those things on. It's very good. And then you'll find it. Good scientist. And it will come back. There we are. Lovely. Uh, Dan is the research fellow for Antarctic Research Centre uh, at Victoria University. So Dan is first got his two minutes and will take you through something very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. My role on the ship, as, as far as science is concerned, was, was really twofold. One is the relate to the work that I do at Victoria University, which is about the changes of the Antarctic ice sheets and the effect on sea level. Um, I could go on about uh, what's expected to happen, but I, I think one of the most powerful observations is, is the measurements that we've been able to make uh, by satellite mostly over the last decade or so of the changes that actually are happening in Antarctica and, and Greenland. And uh, this is a big block of ice, uh, a billion tons, uh, about a cubic kilometre shown for scale in Wellington Harbour. And uh, uh, for perspective, that's, um, I think, about eight seconds worth of Lionel's ocean current. Um, but it's, as, as far as the ice sheet is concerned, um, over the last 10 years that we've been able to measure, Antarctica has been losing, for good, this much ice every, every couple of days. Um, and that is contributing significantly to sea level rise and, and will continue to do so. The other role I had on the ship, um, as Lionel said, uh, was, was outside my field of expertise, but it was a real privilege to be responsible for deploying these oceanographic floats. Um, they're, they're absolutely fantastic little things, um, worth about the price of a medium-sized car. Um, they, you, you deploy them into the ocean, they, they can control their own buoyancy and they sink down to uh, 1,000 or 1,500 metres depth and stop there and, and wait for 10 days or so. When the uh, clock wakes them up, they, they drop even further down to about 2,000 metres and rise slowly back to the surface, measuring temperature and salinity as they go, the things that oceanographers want to know. Um, and when they get to the top, the, uh, they, they have a satellite telephone and a GPS thing on the top there. They call home, uh, send their data back, ask for new instructions, and, and then sink it back down. And um, can keep on doing this for, for several years. I think the, there was one taken out of the ocean recently that had lasted for more than five years. Um, and in order to cover the world's oceans, there are astonishingly three and a half thousand of these out there. Um, providing oceanographers with more information every year than had been got in the century before they invented, they were invented. It's, it's a wonderful invention. Um, so this shows, I'm sure I'm going over my time here, I'm sure, I'm sure they told us five minutes now. <laughs> um, this, this map shows, oh the, the, the uh, title's been cropped, but this shows the, the, in the red the, uh, the floats that we deployed on this voyage. And in the blue dots and the blue squiggles, the, the, the locations and tracks of, of uh, floats before that. And the really significant thing is that they, they more or less stopped, their ocean coverage stopped at 60 south. Um, and that was by design. 
uh, these floats were not built to deal with the, the rigors of the Southern Ocean and the sea ice. And, and the aim had been to cover the ocean from 60 north to 60 south. In recent years, people realized that wasn't enough and new, new floats were invented um, that are smart enough to recognize the ice conditions above their head and, and not to try and break through it. Um, and, and ours are, as you see, among the first to be deployed into the Southern Ocean and, and we expect very interesting results from them. Just to update that with the, the trajectories <coughs> since we deployed them, you can see the ones up, up here in the, in the fast flowing currents around the Canyon Plateau and in the uh, circumpolar current have, have moved quite far since we left them there in February. Uh, the ones down here we, we, we haven't heard so much from and uh, it's because they're in that really interesting zone of sea ice. And I stayed up a bit late last night animating this, so I hope you think it's worth it. <laughs> this is uh, uh, two days a second of sea ice from the beginning of this year. Um, so this is midsummer in Antarctica, and you can see the ice is, is, is melting away. The Ross Sea is largely free. And uh, Come the middle of February, you'll see our voyage arriving <laughs> in from the north, having seen the sub times, there we are, and deploying floats along the way, as you can see with, the, with these tracks. There we go, just a few short days in the, in the Ross Sea. And look after we left how quickly the, the Ross Sea began to freeze up behind us. Really quite astonishing. And, and within a month or so, whoosh, it's, it's all full. Meanwhile, every 10 days, the floats are, are sending back their information, not just their location, but, but the temperature and salinity down to 2,000 meters. Um, and while well, these ones here are, are sending back plenty of data and, and moving fast, it's really conspicuous that these ones, which are covered by ice, are, as they were designed to, not reporting back. Um, the, the one on the, just on the northern end here has managed to uh, keep on finding open water and sending back. In fact, it disappeared for about a month, but, but just last week I got a, a, a message back from it, um, including, whoops, yeah, there we go, including the, uh, a couple of attempts when it had tried to get to the surface, realized there was ice and, and gone back down. So it had the temperature data, but, but not the location. Um, I'll, I'll finish off with, with rather than the, the, the raw science of this, just trying to uh, visualize what this place is like. Down here in, in the Ross Sea, at the moment, the sea is completely covered with ice. It's also completely dark. There, there is, they're in the middle of their polar night and there is no sunshine for 24 hours a day. And the ice is, is, is really one frozen flat sheet, maybe occasional breaks where, it, where it's breaking up. And there's almost no life. There are a few seals and some emperor penguins hanging around Ross Island. Up here on the north edge, um, there's several hours of, of sunshine per day, at least daylight. <laughs> um, the ice is also much more broken up. It's moving much faster. Uh, it's in small pieces and it's mixed with open water. And there's probably an awful lot of, of the Antarctic seals and penguins spending their winter there on the edge of the sea ice. Uh, as far as the ocean is concerned, the, the last data I got back from this float show that where it's uh, at the bottom of its trajectory, 2,000 meters down, it's, it's 0.8, one degree water. As it rows back up to the surface, it comes through slightly warmer water. There's a ton of water flowing in from the north, which is about two degrees. And then when it gets to the surface and starts sending its data back, it's, it's the temperature of freezing seawater, which is about, about minus 1.8. So that's the, uh, the latest book from the Southern Ocean. I think, you were, I think you were right. I think it's more like five minutes. But if I tell you two minutes, uh, scientists will, of course, expect five minutes. That's the way it works best tonight. Um, and some of you might be seeing quite regularly that little bear. Um, some of you might know who that is, that Shackleton bear. It was a bear concept. Uh, not the type of drink, but the little wee bear that was taken by John McChrystal uh, to Gareth and shown him for the very first time saying, I want to take a bear all the way to Antarctica and back. And Gareth said, it's the ugliest bear I've ever seen. And did, almost didn't want to take it on board. And Chapman Bear has become an absolute hit with schools. 
250 or so schools know him um, intimately. They love this chap on beer. He's even got a book now that's actually in the foyer. Uh, you've just got to see with real pictures of the beer in Antarctica. And he is probably more famous now than everyone here tonight. <laughs> but that's great. And that's been our way of contacting all the children. And they just love it. And they're very buying in on all of this. What we tell them, which is why we did it in the first place. A man who we call the godfather of the trip, really. You didn't want to cross it, or you might find yourself on an iceberg heading south. Uh, it was a man that had a lot to say when asked. And he, of course, is magnificent, the former head of the Antarctic Policy Unit in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, in fact. He's the wonderful Trevor Hughes. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, Thanks watch how you go there. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, but some of my best friends are scientists. <laughs> For the better part of four decades, I was in the New Zealand Foreign Service. And for the last nine years of that time, I led, I had the privilege to lead the New Zealand delegations to the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting and to the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, um, which are part of the Antarctic Treaty System. I just want to say a few words, very briefly, about what I see as the, the crucial importance of scientists and diplomats working together. There is a very important uh, synergy between science and diplomacy. And that is perhaps demonstrated no more clearly than in Antarctica, the very fact that we have the wonderful Antarctic Treaty, which was negotiated in 1959, as you know, when the Cold War was gathering pace, and where there were some very difficult issues to be confronted, including the concern that conflict might break out on the Antarctic Peninsula, where you had three overlapping territorial claims between Chile, Argentina, and the United Kingdom. And the concern also that Antarctica might become another theater in the Cold War, that missiles might be deployed there, or bombs tested. Bombs were tested in the Arctic. Why not the Antarctic? <coughs> well, the diplomats of the time uh, faced some serious challenges, and the way ahead was not clear until the success of International Geophysical Year, 1957-1959, showed the value of international scientific cooperation <coughs> in Antarctica. And the fact that that value was so clearly demonstrated enabled the diplomats to reach interesting compromises on formerly quite difficult issues. For example, the agreement to disagree on the whole question of territorial sovereignty in Antarctica, which is still the linchpin of the whole Antarctic Treaty system. So if you look at our Article 4 of the Antarctic Treaty, you'll see it sitting there. Uh, those of us who claim territory or assert a right of territory in Antarctica are allowed to believe that. <laughs> but those who don't recognize such territory uh, or such claims or such, even the possibility of sovereignty in Antarctica, by signing the treaty, they were not committed to have to change their view on that. So that was an amazing achievement and it enabled, it enabled the good things that our scientists do now there uh, to go ahead. And of course, IGY produced some fantastic uh, results. Confirmation of the theory of continental drift, I believe, came out of that. And we had International Polar Year, a successor, if you like, it happens every 50 years, uh, to IGY in 2007, 2009. And the Andrew Project, and Jeff lost my slide, but I was going to show the Andrew Project as a, a very uh, pertinent and, uh, well, supreme example, really, of international scientific cooperation in Antarctica, where New Zealand, as the project manager, and as the supplier of the amazing drilling technology to go through that ice shelf, through the water column, into the floor of the Ross Sea, and extract core more than a kilometre long, which the scientists are still busily st studying, to see these stories about the collapse and, um, and uh, then the regeneration of the ice shelf under different CO2 conditions. That uh, project uh, also involved, famously of course, the Americans, who put up about half the money, we put up about 25%, and the Germans and the Italians. And it was one of the biggest projects in Antarctica and New Zealand got an awful lot of kudos out of it. So the other thing that our scientists can demonstrate is that we're not just a truck stop on the way to Antarctica. We, we actually have a little bit of value to add here. So scientists and diplomats working together, the councils of the Antarctic Treaty System always make provision for 
heavy science input. If we have a problem, if it's around the management of fisheries in Antarctica, we sit there and we listen to our scientists. And we do the best we can in terms of making policy with what is often called the best available science. That's what we look for. Um, and so I've been working with these scientists for the better part of a decade and somehow getting along with them, uh, even when they snore when we share cabins or boats. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rob. I thought I'd tell all these people first. So, anyway, I've had my two minutes of fame. And uh, all I would say is that it's really crucial. This is why I really thought Gareth's project was so important to stimulate awareness of the importance of the Southern Ocean and Antarctica among New Zealanders. Because it's really important for New Zealand to continue to play a strong role, a leading role, as we have in the Antarctic Treaty System, both through our diplomatic effort and through the wonderful work of our scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's wonderful to hear from you again. And uh, to lose that slide, uh, Jeff, you'll be swimming with the fishes, I'm sure. <laughs> and a person who needs a segue, swimming with the fishes, would love to swim with the fishes, and given a chance. We call him our whale expert uh, because he knew more about whales from just seeing the fin. He can tell us what type it was. We just got excited and said, oh, it must be a, a Moby Dick or something like that. Uh, he was able to tell us what it was and also was the entertainer and the fantastic magician on board kept us uh, entertained <laughs> right throughout the journey. He's got many talents, but the one he's here to talk about now is his love of Wales. He is, of course, Anton Van Halden, the collection manager of marine mammals from Te Papa. Round of applause, please, for Anton. Uh, good evening, thank you. Um, I walked past uh, Trevor's uh, cabin. I thought it was Shaco and Bear snoring, but it wasn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, the. Um, <laughs> One of the really interesting things for me, so it wasn't just whales that I talked about, but also seals, being other marine mammals that I'm responsible for, but and was on board to, to share information about. Uh, but I want to bring back, you know, where's this secret button that, oh, there is a dot, see? This is Antarctica here. Um, and this is the circumpolar current that Lionel, Lionel was talking about. And it didn't always used to exist. Uh, that's something I don't think you mentioned, but uh, that once upon a time uh, there were strange whales inhabiting these seas. But uh, this whole area is. We've done it again. <laughs> Need smaller fingers, is what the uh, question. Uh, this whole area is absolutely key to the evolution particularly of the modern groups of whales that we see today. So that was one of the stories that I wanted to share with people uh, because it's also uh, an area which is undergoing considerable change now as we've heard from, from both Lionel and Dan and Trevor in fact, <laughs> uh, that, uh, the, you know, that these, uh, these animals have undergone a lot of evolutionary change over a long period of time and yet we are putting them perhaps through uh, a series of changes that um, they may not be equipped to face. Uh, that's a whole other story. But the interesting thing, I suppose, is if you look back, uh, the earliest whales date back to about 50 million years ago, but when we get to this point in time where we start to enter what's called the Ice House Earth, where this circumpolar current opened up, creating, in effect, as uh, Lionel has showed us, the ocean currents that we see today, the transport of nutrients, the uh, the upwelling areas, the uh, the great area, these great gyres and production areas for uh, for phytoplankton that also give us this incredible bounty of uh, seasonal uh, biomass of, of krill and silverfish in the Ross Sea that gave uh, the opportunity for the modern groups of whales. And so these are some of the early monsters that we uh, that we may have seen. Animals predisposed, the early baleen whales, we see the origin of the earliest baleen whales at about 35 million years ago. Um, so these animals were predisposed to being able to ingest large volumes of small prey, uh, which we have seen the specialisation of that and the development of this rather unique feeding structure called baleen. Um, not that you can qualify unique, it is unique. Uh, the, and the development of these echolocating uh, toothed whales uh, being able to feed on single prey 
items. This is the earliest known, uh, it's a representation of what is the earliest known uh, echo locating tooth whale, Simocetus, which is in about here. And so these are animals that came into being in this part of the world. And we're fortunate in New Zealand to be able to see some of these fossils. And some of the, the very earliest baleen whale fossils are found from uh, in this area here. But uh, so we know them from Antarctica. So this is uh, so this is a fundamentally important area for whales, and was for a very long time, until industrial whaling and sealing came about, uh, which takes us into another reason why we're going to look at some of the impacts that we have had as human beings on these particular groups of animals. So first of all, sealing was the uh, was the primary uh, industry. Uh, Captain Cook came through and said, "Wow, there's lots of seals down here," and in about 1790 or so, by 1840, there was about none left. Uh, some 7 million seals taken out of the Southern Ocean. Uh, the first seal industry completely collapsed. In fact, most of the first seal um, pelts uh, went, to, uh, went to China. This is interesting. Um, the elephant seals were rendered for their blubber, and once they were gone, they started uh, uh, tackling the um, putting um, melting down um, penguins, which is a, a lovely, lovely thing to consider. <laughs> um, through to, I've got to say, we're still impacting on them. Uh, here's uh, this, this is our New Zealand sea lion here, and as many have indicated, we may be impacting, it may not be just climate change impacting on these things, but also uh, fishing industry and fishing practices, um, which we could talk about at length, but I have two minutes, so we'll move on. Um, the key thing for me is a lot of people talk about the Ross Sea. When we talk about the Ross Sea, we're thinking about it as being this wonderful, pristine place that we need to preserve. And relatively speaking, perhaps it is uh, pristine. But if you imagine the Serengeti without uh, without elephants, giraffes, uh, news, and various other uh, zebras and whatever else, uh, you might think that that would be the equivalent to the Ross Sea now. If you think that we, once upon a time, took out, and we're talking industrial whaling, so from, if you look at the, uh, the essentially a time period here from, uh, from sort of when industrial whaling started, which is around the turn of the 19th, uh, so turn of the 20th century, so around 1900 through to about 1986 when the moratorium uh, was imposed, some over 2 million whales were taken out of the Southern Ocean. And these are very, very large and important animals for a, an ecosystem. And you think, uh, well, there's the blue whales. Look, some 350,000 blue whales uh, protected since about 1930. Um, consequently, uh, hunted illegally uh, by the Russians in this particular instance. We can see that um, enormous numbers of, of these very, very large animals that have a, a huge impact in terms of the, uh, the movement of nutrients in the Southern Ocean. <coughs> And those are things that uh, maybe Rob will allude to, but um, <laughs> not. <laughs> but you can see what a huge impact that we've had. Over 700, 710,000 fin whales, which are the junior cousins to the, uh, to the blue whale. But if you think that protected since 1933 or thereabouts, the, uh, the blue whale is still, the population in the Southern Ocean is only about maybe somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 animals. So they're about 1% of what uh, they once were before we came in and destroyed them in a very, very short space of time. And I think that's something to be, uh, to really consider. I mean, we think about the, the various fishing industries that go on and the, uh, the, the Antarctic toothfish and so forth. And we need to think about the, our approach to harvesting these animals. And when you talk, when Trevor talks about a wonderful functioning system in the um, Antarctic treaty system, uh, you can look at a very dysfunctional system in the uh, International Whaling Commission and how uh, little it might take for it to turn one into the other. Um, I mean, we might destroy an Antarctic treaty system. Uh, it seems hard that we will rectify the International Whaling Commission anytime soon. Anyway, so yeah, New Zealand sea lions. These are animals that have you can think that these, these animals are very important to us. Once they were around all the shores of New Zealand and now reduced to a population of under, probably, oops, 
probably under 10,000 animals, uh, which is less than Kiwis uh, in New Zealand. Uh, we spend a lot of money on birds, we spend a lot of money on all sorts of things, and I think that's all very valuable. But here's this absolutely wonderful, wonderful animal, and uh, it's indeed in great peril. So I uh, leave that for you to ponder. Anyway, thanks. Plants. I'm very passionate about this subject, which is great. You can never be the person representing so many large creatures. Uh, finally, now uh, speakers of note, uh, the general manager of research for the National Institute of Water and Atmosphere at NIWA. That's well, that's what it is when you actually NIWA is the short version. Um, I'm going to invite him up now. It's wonderful, Rob Murdoch. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Nick. Um, I, think I went along on the voyage really uh, to provide information around the, the marine biology of the oceans, if you like, and how that leads through to various stages in the food web. So I'm going to sort of take that sort of tack. But the first thing I'd like to, just as an observation, as we headed south, of course, we went through the sub-Antarctic islands and we also headed back through some of the sub-Antarctic on this trip as well. And one of the things that's most striking is the fact that these things really are jewels when it comes to our marine biodiversity, our biodiversity generally. And of course, they're hotspots for seabird biodiversity. In fact, 25% of all the different seabird species can be found on our sub-Antarctics. And if you look at the albatross that are shown here, for example, eight of the 22 species only breed on the New Zealand sub-Antarctic islands. So the sub-Antarctic really are an important place for southern ocean biodiversity. But there's a whole range of other seabirds. We have some endemic species of penguins, and you can see some of them up there. And even some of these islands have their own species of shag. And you can see a, a picture of one of the Auckland Island shag with beautiful colours around its, its bill. <coughs> So we have this fantastic area where there are these animals um, in the southern Antarctic. And they're adapted to a pretty harsh environment down in the Southern Ocean. But when you get down to the Antarctic proper, of course you start to see some of the bigger animals like this, the weedle seals and what have you. But the seabed itself we know is also covered with an incredible biodiversity. Lots of different types of invertebrates. And um, these are also very unique, they're endemic to this part of the world, and they're adapted to this incredibly harsh environment. This, you've heard all from Lionel and others that the, the seawater down there, particularly in the Ross Sea, doesn't change much summer or winter, and it's all just above freezing, around about 1.7 to 1.8 degrees Celsius. And these animals have evolved to live with that, including the little ice fish at the top. It doesn't have any, any blood, it doesn't need it. It's got low metabolism, and it just gets the oxygen in from the surrounding water. The, uh, I can get this pointer to work. This little fish here is, a, is uh, a fish that's only found around the Antarctic continent. It's called the Antarctic silverfish. We know it's an incredible part of the food web down there, and it's a major link from the plankton through to the larger animals, such as your seals, penguins, and whales. And of course, we all know about krill, and there are many species, a number of different species of krill which also occur just in these areas, and they also, of course, are that important link between the, the, particularly the plant plankton, the silverfish, and then the larger, larger animals. So we've got a very unique environment down there. I'm going to show you a picture now, which I think is, is um, really quite spectacular. It shows you um, one of the penguin colonies. This is a king penguin colony on, on uh, Macquarie Island. And while these animals are adapted to an incredibly harsh environment, they're also, it, it points to the fact that they're actually quite resilient. Now, these populations were decimated by sealers once, as Anton's um, indicated, once they <coughs> ran out of seals, they started taking the penguins. And they decimated this population down to, to near zero. But over the last 100 years or so, they've basically come back and they're now pretty much back to their normal population levels. And this is just to give you some idea of the scale of the penguin populations. <laughs> so this is just one of the colonies, it's the major colony. And as this pans along, you also see the remains of the boilers that they used to boil down this penguin colony. And there are the boilers. And it goes on and on and on. And 
What I think this demonstrates is that these populations are relatively resilient. They can rebound after the man has had quite big impacts. And I think uh, when you look at the Southern Antarctic Islands, we've now made many of them predator-free, and some of those populations now are able to flourish. But I think, for me, for me one of the big challenges we can is actually due to the changing climate. And this is something that these animals don't necessarily respond to or rebound from when those changes take place. And at the moment we're talking about a climate that's changing incredibly rapidly and we still don't know effectively how well these animals are going to adapt to that changing system. And I just want to just Lionel mention this, but these are some of the animals we know that are responding now and the populations have declined. The rock hopper penguin, the elephant seals and the, the grey-headed albatross. These have all had huge reductions in their populations on southern around southern Antarctic islands. Uh, many of them have reduced by up to 90% now since uh, the 1940s, well before fishing started in this region. And we believe, and some of the evidence is now suggesting, that they are. this is a response to the changing of the climate. And I suppose the challenge for us is what's going to happen into the future, and that's one of the big unknowns. We don't know enough about how the biological system is going to respond to the sorts of um, key drivers that Lionel talked about. And I've put the, uh, the New Zealand sea line up there as well. We know that it's being impacted by fishing, but there is also some indicators that there's, a, there's an environmental effect that's, be, that's perhaps beyond fishing. And then I just lastly wanted to talk about ocean acidification because there is also another challenge for our life down in this part of the world, and that is due to the fact that the ocean is acidifying, as Lionel mentioned. And uh, the oceans have acidified by, they've increased by about 30% in acidity since the 1770s. Um, and they're increasing at a rate that's pretty much unprecedented over the last 800,000 years. The question is, how well will our marine life adapt to that? And the animals that are going to be impacted most are those that have a calcareous skeleton. And you can see up there in this diagram, we've got the carbon dioxide molecules entering into the ocean and then that changes the acidity, and that changes the ability of animals to create a calcareous skeleton. And that's going to impact a huge array of different types of organisms, everything from the little planktonic organisms that Lionel talked about, right through to all animals such as crabs, shellfish, um, corals, anything that has a calcareous skeleton. And it's very interesting to note that at the moment, off the coast of California, the oyster fisheries there, particularly their aquaculture industry, seems to be suffering because of ocean acidification. The, the little tiny spat that develop are unable to develop shells and they're getting massive recruitment failure. So there is already quite big examples of where ocean acidification is impacting on the oceans right now. And our big challenge is to know exactly how this is going to impact on the Southern Ocean and the life that's in there. And of course, that have a flow on effect all, all the way through to the role that the biology in the ocean plays in terms of controlling the gaseous composition in the atmosphere and um, climate. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Gareth took me aside one day when we were in sort of three quarters of the way through and he said, where in the world would you get so many amazing scientists in one place at his beck and call every hour of the day, and they couldn't get off the ship. He was so excited because he had all this amazing uh, knowledge on board, and he only had to knock on a door if he had a question while he was writing books. It was a truly amazing experience having so many good people on board who knew so much about so many things. And we've got about five or seven minutes to take any question you like from the floor, and any of these wonderful people, including Lionel, if you like, come up, we'll answer them. But they'll have to be quick to try to get through a few answers if we can. So we've got a mic up there, and this is a chance. It could be anything at all. But these minds here and their knowledge, it's a wonderful experience. It's like Gareth. You can pretend you are Gareth, maybe without owning a football company, but you can still ask the questions if you feel like it. So just put your hand up, and we'll deliver a mic to you so you can ask. And uh, don't be shy. That's the main thing. Because we've got just a couple of minutes to go. Oh, good. There's one over here. Let's begin. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation this evening. Uh, you've spoken of some quite dire uh, conditions that you've experienced in the Southern Ocean. Um, in terms of solutions, uh, if we could go down uh, the panel beginning at one end 
not repeating each other, and you could give us each a, uh, a single, what you think would be the most single important thing that each of us could do to make a change uh, to the situations you each spoke about. Great. Right. I mean, you can boat one off, it's like sun tips the island. There, you know. <laughs> uh, for me, one of the most shocking things that came out of this trip was realising that uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about marine protection in Antarctica at the moment, but in New Zealand's own EEZ, only 0.3% is protected in marine reserves. I think that's pretty shocking. Well, that's an interesting point, Jeff. Some of the stuff we've done in Antarctica is far more sort of world-leading than anything we've done in our own backyard. But uh, for me, I think the, the main message is to, you know, science is very expensive, generally, but we have to keep resourcing it, even though we're a small country. And we obviously have to target our resources in the most effective way, but uh, this is too important for us to walk away from. We have to remain committed. Um, I think, uh, I, following on a little bit from Trevor, I think we need to better understand what's happening down there. And the reason I say that is that Regardless of what we do around our greenhouse gas emissions, and there's no question that as a planet we should be trying to reduce those, or at least hold them, um, the system's going to keep changing, and it is changing, and we need to better understand what those changes are. If we are to adapt to, adapt to the changes in the climate system that are going to impact on us and how best we can, we can then help and manage some of the conservation challenges that we have. In terms of the science I showed, uh, stopping the Antarctic ice sheet melting isn't something you can address individually. Um, it, it really can only be done as a, as a planet, as a whole community. But for New Zealand, I, I think uh, seizing a goal like making the whole nation independent of fossil fuels would, would uh, get us well on the way. I, <laughs> there's lots of things, I, you know, we impact uh, we impact on, on animals every day in our environment through uh, various various practices and just the disposal of plastics and there's all those sorts of things that we, I mean I've myself been involved with cutting plastics out of the stomachs of whales and I think, you know, that, uh, something, you know, we can we can do things at home that, that really can minimise, as, um, as Lionel mentioned earlier, about minimising our own footprint. But I do think to kind of go on from what uh, Jeff said, I think it's extraordinary, you know, that here we are, a nation with an enormous EEZ, uh, with, you know, enormous oceans that we have to take it, uh, that we look after, uh, and yet we have a Minister of Racing, but no Minister of Oceans. And um, somehow, you know, we need to petition our governments to be responsible, but we, it starts by being responsible ourselves. Thank you. New Zealand takes great pride in the things it's done in the past, whether it's granting women a franchise, whether it's uh, social welfare, whether it's nuclear fr going nuclear free. We've made courageous decisions. To me, the problem is enormous. It is a global problem. And I think New Zealand can take a role by the government doing something courageous. Now, I know that doesn't world with governments doing something courageous because they are thinking for the next election. Yeah. But, for example, let's say, as, as you know, this is not a bug, but let's say we ban the export of coal overseas. It's one thing. But because New Zealand does it, and we have a lot of influence on the planet, by what we've done in the past, and my hope would be that if the New Zealand government did this courageous thing, and quite frankly, the only way it will do a courageous thing if the will of the people want this so, as with women's franchise, then we can make headway. But we really have to do something quite radical. It's a marvellous, a marvellous question. Do we have time for another one? Oh, yes, there's a woman right just there. Are we? There we are. Yes. I like the parts of the microphone. It's sort of like the Olympics, isn't it, really? <laughs> oh, I would like to thank you very much for this evening and for the uh, one we had a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, I'm just an amateur botanist 
And I would like to ask you very humbly why you didn't take a botanist with you on this. <laughs> <laughs> because I do know that in these sub-Antarctic islands there are amazing mega herbs, which uh, we did see a picture of one in that gnarled forest. I'm not quite sure what it was. That have enormous leaves, presumably to um, overcome the lack of light intensity, and enormous flowers too. And I would think that um, it was a great shame that somebody wasn't there to study these plants, which are more important really than animals. <laughs> Uh, yes, let's not, let's not forget that most of the plants are in the ocean. Um, the, the thing that there's, that, uh, Gareth selected some people to be on board to talk to various things, but there were already people uh, on board the boat who run the tours, heritage tours, who do an absolutely tremendous job about sharing a lot of information, whether it be about, uh, we didn't actually have a seabird biologist on board as such, um, but we had people also on shore that had contributed in terms of uh, teaching through video and various other various other means. But uh, Rodney Russ, who runs Heritage Tours, did an absolutely terrific job of also provisioning people with information on uh, the various uh, plants that we did see. And uh, certainly, you know, we, we all stumbled over many wonderful mega herbs. Well, it was a pity you didn't have somebody to tell us about it. <laughs> oh, tonight you might. <laughs> Uh, good point. Yeah. That's a shame. I mean, the islands do have these magnificent, um, as you rightly say, they have some beautiful plants. I mean, some of them are endemic onto the... On the each island has its own endemic plants, not many. Uh, the mega herbs that you see down there are spectacular, and it's a shame we couldn't show you any photos of those. We did take them. Um, but they are spectacular, as you say, and uh, a lot of them were flowering when we were there. Campbell Island had uh, some of the plural films that were flowering were spectacular. And there are, the lot of are now coming back because the stock have been removed, of course, and now that the rats have gone, um, a lot of these mega herbs, the seabeds, are, are now flourishing and we're seeing a massive return of some of these mega herbs. And the same on Enderby Island with the removal of rabbits and cattle and other things, we've seen big returns. So we also had Andy Roberts from the Department of Conservation who was able to tell us about a lot of the mega herbs. I suppose the only other thing to say is um, that we actually had people on board who were collecting marine algae for some of our scientists back in Niwa. And there were in fact, I think, something close to 400 different species of algae found around the Antarctic continent. And in fact, we even collected some algae on one of the beaches near Shackleton's hut. <coughs> so um, we did collect marine algae, but I can't honestly tell you too much about exactly what we found. I know that there were a couple, I think there was at least one new species collected from the Auckland Islands. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, um, it was just, I think for timing, no, I just saw it um, over there. For timing, because we did want to finish just around 8 o'clock, which is right now. Um, just to check that everyone's fine, if we end our Q&A right there. I know that some of you could probably ask questions for quite some time, but uh, if you're, oh, one more from you, yes. Could I just say that um, Dr. Janice Lord from Otago University did quite a lot of work with mega herbs up until December 2011 and um, it was all about um, their, their temperature and how they responded to the temperature on the island. Um, but she is a wonderful bit of botanist at Otago with his work down there. Thank you, and, uh, and it does sound like we probably should have had one of them today, <laughs> yeah, next time. Uh, but next time, and uh, Sarah um, did actually get some seaweed while she was there, many different types of seaweed, one of them I think was a brand new species, so yeah, a lot of work going on, but you are right, not represented here tonight, uh, but in some ways, at the end, represented more than most of the other things, which I think is good, it's very good. Um, thank you very much everyone. Uh, if it hadn't been for the Friends of Tapapa, I don't think we would have had so many people here tonight. So we would like Shona Spencer uh, to come up, please, and give her vote of thanks to you all. Thank you very much. Well, I really feel very humble standing here amidst this company. Um, I'm passionate, yes, scientists know, uh, and as a complete uh, 
genuine, genuinely concerned citizen, I would just have to say you've all impressed me so much today, this evening, and I'm sure everyone here feels exactly the same way. And to gather up so many of you tonight, I'd like to thank each one individually, all of you as a group, and keep up the good work, please. Uh, it was lovely that eventually we did have an input of, from the other sex, from my, the other gender. <laughs> um, and yet, uh, fear not, you've all impressed us very much. And thank you on behalf of the friends and everybody present, please join me in thanking our friends. Thank you very much everybody. Uh, just a couple of things to mention. Uh, one is there are the books for sale out there at 20% off today um, and they have been very popular and uh, they do cover a couple of the issues that were brought up here today. We thank our fantastic uh, crew members that have come and you as well. And there is a roadshow coming through New Zealand starting very soon. Actually our first one is a tester in company um, I think next Wednesday. And then we take off, we go all the way from um, Whangarei all the way down to Invercargill Gareth's taking the team on the road. Wellington's date is? Tuesday the 7th of August. Tuesday the 7th of August at Wellington College. Uh, and you can actually go online to see about it. So if you do have any friends, if you're impressed with what you heard tonight and have any friends that would like to come to that presentation, we'd love to see you there. Other than that, if you feel like giving generous, uh, generously to the Million Dollar Mouse campaign, there are buckets, which I'm sure you saw on the way in, uh, and maybe you'll put something in on the way out if you haven't already done so. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.